Susanna Manrubia, yes. who will speak about evolution on genotype networks leads to phenotypic entrapment. So I was lucky enough to be the first speaker of the conference. And uh, I should first of all thank you for your resistance and uh, I hope you think it's worth staying here until the last talk. And I promise I'll be brief and I will not say I have to skip things during my talk and I hope uh, I'll go to the point, okay? So I have to say first that this is theoretical work for the moment, okay? I come from physics and uh, we mostly have a group of theoreticians and although we are always motivated by biological observations and by empirical measurements, so um, what we are presenting here is, for the moment, so uh, uh, a theoretical formal result, although it has, I think, important implications that I will try to discuss briefly. Okay, let's see. This is the outline, so I will just give a few uh, ideas about this genotype-phenotype map, which is so complex, we all know and about uh, something that has been already discussed, these ideas of how we should look at fitness landscapes and how misleading this idea of the hills and valleys has been in shaping the way we think populations evolve. Right. So uh, then I will proceed with some examples of what I mean by these genotype networks and go straight to how we model these networks and what implications the topology of these networks has for the uh, dynamics of populations. Right. Just a very brief slide telling that this is a first step to go to networks of phenotypes because this is what uh, at the end we aim at because uh, our goal is to describe the evolution of changes in phenotype, maybe. So we are starting from the uh, very uh, so molecular level. So maybe to build on that, see until where, until where. And then some perspectives, certainly there is much work to be done, much more than what has been done until now. So the idea of, of these genotype networks goes back probably to Maynard Smith in the 70s when he was concerned and discussing um, navigability of the space of genomes. So he meant that if you have a population and a population has to innovate to encounter a new phenotype, there has to be a way of changing the genotype of the network without losing fitness. Right? He was illustrating this with uh, this cartoon where he meant, well, you can make point mutations in four letter words, and you can construct a network of, minimum f of meaningful words that is, say, the, the, this uh, metaphor of navigability of my space of genotypes. So um, certainly we know that, that there is a high degree of redundancy when we go from the genotype to the phenotype. You have your DNA sequence. This should be coding, for instance, for a protein. And you have lots of mutations which are synonymous and maybe uh, that even not being synonymous leads to the same structure and uh, the structure of a protein is important. You might have some functional sites if those sites are maintained. Maybe your protein is working as well as the non-mutated protein, right? So this is a level of redundancy. Then you may have, as I was saying, these irrelevant structural changes that do not affect the function of the protein. And you even can have a protein that is not working. We all know about these gene knockout experiments where you just delete a gene maybe and you have a higher level of redundancy, which is the network of interactions between genes. And still you might have an organism which is functional in the environment where it's uh, evolving or uh, replicating at a certain point. So that's to say in the way from genotype to phenotype, we have all these layers, this cake, this redundancy at many different levels, and the result is that I have many different genotypes which are compatible with uh, one phenotype, okay? So one wonders how big is this space? Well, just uh, this is, since I saw that everybody was putting pictures of someone in the conference, I thought I should also <laughs> get some people, some important people for these ideas, and this is the idea of uh, uh, neutral theory by Kimura, and also the nearly neutral theory of Ota. Right. See, th this is uh, so the, their idea is that there is this many redundancy and it doesn't have to be exact in a sense, like Ota was saying. So if you have a small populations, you have a tolerance to deleterious mutations and you can have uh, so many more genotypes compatible with a phenotype. Right. So the idea is that you can have your genotype space and you can decompose it once you have defined your phenotype into networks of genotypes. 
right? There is a way to do that. The, you, you need much knowledge about your system, right? But in principle, this is something doable. And then you will have one phenotype, which is defined by an ensemble of different genotypes, and another phenotype, which corresponds to another one. And this is also to emphasize that these are extremely highly dimensional spaces. This is just in dimension four, projection on dimension two. But in general, for any sequence with an alphabet of, uh, say, here is two letters, zero and one. But if you have four letters, then in general, you would have four to the power L, where L is the length of your sequence, different neighbors. And this would be the dimensionality of my space. So this is something that we cannot imagine. We are constrained to a three-dimensional world. Right? And uh, so it's useless to try to project this on two dimensions. But we have to know, we have to be aware that the properties of those spaces differ very much from properties of spaces that I can plot uh, on, on a two dimensions, like, like topography. Right? So then when we re re revisit landscapes and we think of this redundancy, we are in a different scenario. So this is the famous peak landscape, where you assign a privileged sequence, the highest fitness, and then it's surrounded by a sea of lower fitness sequences. And so this means that any mutations that I can make in my sequence will lower fitness, will be deleterious, and so on. And this has important implications in evolution. So either my population is there, or my population will be less adapted. But if I go to phenotypes and I consider this degree of redundancy that I was discussing, then all of a sudden I have a layer, a hypersurface, or uh, an, an ensemble of paths that allow me to go from one region of the space to another. And here I'm essentially showing these two possibilities. Either I am fit or I am not. But if we go to more complex uh, landscapes, like the Fujiyama landscape, where you have this central sequence and every mutation that departs from this sequence lowers your fitness progressively, and I try to represent this considering this redundancy, suddenly I have a very different picture of my space. And I see that in certain neighborhoods, I, s I have some phenotypes that are achievable by single mutations in this uh, ideal case. But if I go to other regions, I might find different solutions, different phenotypes, different innovations, maybe. And the same case occurs with random landscapes. While here, it seems that there are no correlations. And well, I lose uh, my signal, and I can find wherever. If we take into account this redundancy, this landscape is very similar to a Fujiyama landscape, right? this random landscape, except for some short range correlations that uh, are beginning to be detected also in real systems, like now with uh, uh, next generation sequencing techniques and so on. OK, so what's a genotype network then? This is just, that was going to be a, an example, but this is just an ensemble of all the genotypes that give me a phenotype compatible with the degree of fitness that I demand in my population. Now, how big are those networks? And for this, I need an example. And my example is RNA. We have RNA sequences. And just attending to thermodynamical principles, we can fold those sequences. There are programs to do that. We just take the programs and uh, assign, this would be a simple scenario, assign some energy to the formation of bonds between some nucleotides. And I get my two-dimensional structures. Typical representation is this one here or this one here in parentheses and points representing so uh, pairs going upstream, closing by downstream pairs, and uh, nucleotides that, have, uh, that are unpaired forming these loops. OK, so this is an example from a real simulation where I just want to get a, a fixed secondary structure, and I just simulated it and gave a fitness. OK, whatever. And I get a number of different sequences that are compatible with this secondary structure. Right? This, is, uh, this is a simplified model. This is going to be my phenotype. These are all my genotypes compatible with that phenotype. Right? So how big are those networks again? So let me give you some numbers. There are, and this is a number that can be calculated, this very big number of different structures in the space of sequences of length n. But if I fix my length to just to give you a flavor of the size of the system. For length 35, the number of different structures goes to 10 to the 10. Okay? But if I consider the number of sequences that I have here, 
it turns out that the average of different sequences per secondary structure, the number of genotypes per phenotype, is in the range of 10 to the 11. 10 to the 11 is the number of stars in the galaxy, is the number of neurons in your brains. And it is a number that even for these very short sequences, it's impossible to explore exhaustively. Right? So, but this is the space of possibilities for a population that is traveling on this space of genotype and just simply would have to maintain this kind of phenotype, in this case, secondary structure of RNA. So these networks are really huge, right? And this gives us the possibility to navigate the space and to find new innovations. Now, the point is, the structure of these networks is going to determine how I move in this space. So this is our next step. How do we determine the topology of these networks? So this is a smaller case that we studied exhaustively, and this is the sequences of length 12, right? You think it's small, but it's not that small. We have uh, more than one million uh, sequences and more than 50 different secondary structures. And this is a representation of the, what we call the degree distributions for different networks in that system. Okay, I have just separated all the genotypes that give me the same phenotype, the same secondary structure, and I, now I count how many neighbors a sequence has in this network. So if I make a mutation, what is the probability that I stay in the same network or that I go to another uh, secondary structure network? If I have many neighbors, like in this case for these large networks, this means that mutations do not affect me much. Right? I can mutate and I still obtain the same secondary structure. If I have few neighbors, then it means that uh, a mutation will disturb the secondary structure and I will go to another phenotype. So we get this kind of distributions. And another important property of these networks is that they are what we call assortative. This means that uh, genotypes that have a small number of neighbors, those neighbors also have a small number of neighbors. There is a correlation in the degree. While if I am very stable and I'm not very affected by mutations, also my neighbors are not very affected by mutations. So high degree means high degree neighboring, okay? These are just the two properties that I need to uh, obtain the general behavior that I'm going to explain in two slides, right? So I have a um, distribution, a certain distribution of the degree of the network, so no, not all genotypes are equal, not all nodes are equal, and the network is assortative. If this is so, then we can construct a dynamical theory that I go very fast over it. This is transformed essentially to a matrix that tells me who is neighbor to whom in my uh, network. I can add other properties like the mutation rate, population size, phenotype fitness, so I could have my landscape, but on those networks, on those space, and I could calculate an important, an interesting property, which would be the probability that the population still stays at the phenotype after a time t has elapsed. So I enter a phenotype, I suffer mutations, I move on my network, and I wonder, so how long will it take me to jump to another phenotype to find another network? And this is a solution. This is a numerical solution, and I will go to a qualitative explanation of it. This is an example of a network with those characteristics that I have told you. And this is the probability after a time t has elapsed that the, I'm still in the, in the network. OK. Now, this is a tame whole message. This function is represented in a linear log scale. If it would be a straight line, this would mean that the probability that I leave my phenotype at any time is a constant. And this is the assumption of most models of phylogeny or models of uh, change of phenotype or whatever. But this is not a constant. This is bending continuously from the beginning to a uh, asymptotic time scale that I see here. So at the beginning, so uh, if you're familiar with things like radioactive decay of the average time of a population a molecule, for instance, to degrade. So this is a constant probability. Then you have an average time life, okay? And this curve would be a straight line. But it turns out that the longer the time I've been sitting on a genotype network, the lower the probability that I leave that phenotype, right? 
So this is not a constant process. This is what in physics called non-Markovian process. And this translates to a process that has memory of what has happened before. It remembers how long it has been there. So if, if I just make a snapshot of my system at a given time, and I wonder what is the probability that this goes to a new phenotype? Well, my answer is not Q or 0, 0,5. It, it, de it depends. How long have you been there? It turns out that this guy who has been for a longer time sitting on that phenotype has a probability of speciating which is lower than a guy that has been sitting on that phenotype for a shorter time. And this is what we call phenotypic entrapment. So you enter those networks typically through the periphery, which has low degree because it has more links pointing outwards. It's easier to get in. And then you, just by simple uh, neutral fixation of mutations, you move into the core where the degree is higher. You get trapped and it's much more difficult to leave. Right? So, and this is a generic property, absolutely, that applies to networks, genotype networks with a degree distribution and that are assortative. That's all I need. So if these properties are fulfilled, then this is the immediate consequence. Right? Okay, so for phenotype networks, we would have to integrate the description of each of these networks into the contact between phenotypes, and this is work in progress. And you see this is the next level, and we already have some ideas about how to do this, but um, I have to finish this. Um, this would be so the contact between phenotypes and how uh, it changes so depending on my size, on the size of this uh, network, on the time I've been there, what's the probability of jumping to another phenotype and so on. This is something that we are working to integrate. There are many things to be done here. So to modify the genotype-phenotype maps, to see if there are any universality properties in those uh, networks, so to extend the definition of phenotype to include other uh, situations, to use more realistic scenarios, and in particular to uh, compare what we are seeing with um, uh, data obtained from natural populations, and also see how networks are modified where instead uh, of point mutations we use, for instance, recombination or other mutational mechanisms. These are the bunch of people actually working, now working on, the, on this project and different branches of it. And here I finish. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.